thank you very much and, and welcome back everybody. Um, so uh, today what, uh, what we will do is we will finish off the discussion of uh, how the directional searches are done. Uh, so I hope that uh, what we did yesterday with the isotropic and the polarized background uh, and, and now uh, with the uh, anisotropic one will give you a sense of how these uh, searches are done uh, in uh, by, at least by the, the LIGO Virgo collaborators. Uh, and then um, I will, uh, as we have time, I will maybe discuss some of the uh, topics of uh, current interest um, uh, in, in terms of the, uh, you know, some, some of the conceptual difficulties and, and some maybe new, new research directions that we're starting. So uh, just as a, a, in a for, for the purpose of a reminder, uh, for anisotropic searches, uh, we start with a two-point correlation uh, uh, function. So we have uh, uh, wave amplitudes uh, for um, uh, polarization A at frequency F uh, traveling in direction omega, and another one with the polarization A prime at frequency F prime traveling in direction of omega prime. We assume that this uh, uh, two-point correlation function uh, takes this form. So again, uh, as usual, we assume that uh, waves of different polarizations, frequencies, or directions are not correlated. Uh, but then, the, the, uh, uh, the, if, they, if, if they are of the same direction and frequency and so on, then the, uh, uh, the correlation function is dependent on both the frequency and the direction. So for the isotropic case, uh, we assume it's only dependent on frequency. For the isotropic polarized case, we assumed it's dependent on the frequency and uh, the polarization. And uh, now we're assuming it to be unpolarized, uh, but so there is no dependence on A uh, here, but we are assuming it to be dependent on both the frequency and the propagation direction. And we also assume that uh, this dependence is separable so that we can write it as a product of two functions one uh, a function of only frequency, the other, the other function of only uh, the direction. So the, the, the way we do this search is uh, slightly different from uh, how we do the isotropic one, at least the formalism is a little bit different uh, uh, in the sense that uh, we start with a simple cross correlation in the frequency space. So we just take the, frequent, the Fourier transforms of, uh, the, uh, uh, of the two detector time series, S1 and S2 and multiply them together, some prefactor, and we call that uh, uh, quantity CFT. So uh, this is a, a cross correlation at a particular frequency uh, F and time T. Now, the reason both of these uh, uh, show up, frequency and time here, is <clears throat> because our analysis is done in uh, small, in small uh, time segments. So we will take the entire year long observation and split it into something like one minute long time segments. Um, so this T here is really tracking which time segment uh, uh, we're, we're analyzing. Uh, that's, that's where the time dependence comes from. And F uh, is, uh, it may appear as a, a continuous uh, uh, function here, but it is really not uh, because in practice, when we do a, a Fourier transform of a limited time segment, what you're left with is really a Fourier series, a discrete series of Fourier components. So um, uh, this F is actually also a discrete uh, quantity or a discrete variable uh, counting the frequency bins, discrete frequency bins in the analysis. Uh, so the expected value of this uh, uh, quantity, now you can, you can go back and actually do the same calculation we did uh, a couple of times uh, where we expand the, uh, uh, the, the gravitational wave, um, uh, in, gravitational waves in the, uh, the plane wave expansion for both uh, detectors, S1 and S2. Uh, we we uh, include the coupling of those waves with the detectors themselves. Remember the, the, uh, the, detector, the, de oh, excuse me, the detector response function, uh, DAB, those are the tensors uh, for the response of the detectors to a given gravitational wave. And then, uh, uh, and then you will have uh, uh, two H's showing up. Uh, so you use uh, the two-point correlation to simplify the integrals or to solve some of the integrals. And what we're left with is an expression that looks like this. Okay, uh, so maybe I'll uh, box it up uh, just to, to be clear. Okay, so this is the expected value of this cross-correlation estimator. 
And you see that uh, H of F shows up just like it did uh, in the isotropic case where on the left-hand side, we would have uh, Y and, uh, and this would be H. And, uh, and then there is the remaining integral over the uh, uh, two sphere. Uh, and the integral has uh, uh, the P of omega that's coming up from the, uh, from the two point correlation. And it has this other uh, uh, object, uh, gamma, which is a function of uh, direction, frequency, and time. And it takes this, uh, this form. So you see the, uh, uh, the usual uh, phase factor. You see the usual uh, uh, um, objects that uh, capture the, the, the coupling of the detector to, uh, to a gravitational wave for both detector one and two, and summed over the polarization. So this is the equivalent of our overlap reduction function that we saw in the isotropic case. And in fact, if, uh, if P here were isotropic, so if we drop the anisotropy uh, assumption, so if P were really uh, just a constant, then this integral would be just the integral over the, the gamma function. And, uh, uh, and that's exactly the integral we uh, saw in the isotropic case, except there is again, no optimal filter here. Uh, so that integral will result in exactly the overlap reduction that we saw in the isotropic case. So uh, that's where we stand. So our, our next uh, uh, step would be to, to um, uh, expand the, uh, um, uh, this uh, uh, function P in terms of some, some basis uh, of uh, elements on the sphere, basis of functions on the sphere. So we can write uh, P of, of uh, omega as some sort of a, a series uh, where, we uh, where we have some uh, uh, parameters P alpha multiplying the basis functions, which I'll uh, label, label as E, uh, which are functions of, uh, of omega. So this can be done. Uh, e, the basis E could be, it could be different things. Uh, it could be uh, the uh, 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 spherical harmonics or it could be pixel basis and so on. And we'll look at uh, those uh, in, in a minute. So the, what happens in this case is if I insert this into my circle, into my uh, uh, boxed in equation, replace this P of omega with the expansion, uh, what I will get is that uh, the expected value of C sub FT is H of F, uh, the uh, coefficients P sub alpha come out, uh, and then we have the, uh, the uh, sum over, A, uh, sorry, Then we have the, the integral uh, over the omega uh, time uh, where, where inside the integral we have the gamma function multiplying the, these uh, basis uh, uh, functions E sub, A, uh, e sub uh, alpha, okay? And, uh, and what, what we can do since, um, since in, in this expression here, gamma, is a purely geometric uh, uh, function, right? If you look at the, uh, what gamma depends on, uh, there's a phase factor that depends only on uh, the separation of the detectors. There are these detector response to objects. There is no uh, uh, actual strain power, or strain um, uh, energy density involved. So this quantity can be calculated once for a given detector pair. And uh, these objects are also well known. So. This is basically a set of functions of uh, frequency. So we can, we can label these as some gammas with index alpha uh, of uh, frequency and time. And uh, uh, so in that case, what we would have is uh, H of F times uh, P sub alpha times gamma sub alpha of F and time. Um, and this becomes a, 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 sim a relatively straightforward uh, uh, linear algebra problem. So again, uh, just to be uh, clear, gamma sub alpha uh, of F and T would be a, a one half sum over A, then there's an integral over D omega, uh, and then we would have uh, E sub, sorry, E sub alpha of A, sorry, I'm mixing things up here. Okay. Uh well, can I interrupt? I, yeah. I wanted to ask for a clarification. So this H of F is not precisely what we computed for the, uh, while we were looking at the uh, isotropic case, right? How does it relate to omega GW? I, I might've missed it. 
But for the anisotropic case, uh, how does it relate to omega GW? Yeah, it, it is actually the same object. Uh, so if you if you uh, go back to to our notes, uh, what we had in the two point correlation, uh, instead of this p of f and omega, we simply had h of f in the isotropic case. Uh, so this h of f, uh, uh, when when we calculate uh, omega gw, which uh, uh, which is one, uh, f over, sorry, which is uh, f over rho c d rho gw df. So then you expand this rho gw into an expected value. Uh, uh, I'm just trying to remind everybody how we did this calculation. There's some pre-factor here that uh, I'm going to ignore, but there is H A B dot with H uh, A B dot contraction. We then do the plane wave expansion uh, of H A Bs here, take derivatives, uh, uh, use the two point correlation function to solve some of the integrals uh, in the expansion. And what we get is uh, something that's proportional to f cubed h of f. This relationship will still hold uh, uh, when we integrate over over all uh, uh, angles. Okay, thanks. Uh, okay. I hope that uh, that makes it clear. So, uh, so the the uh, uh, results now uh, we can now. Uh, uh, write our results explicitly in the pixel basis. Uh, in the pixel basis, uh, remember what we would write is that uh, 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 E sub alpha of, uh, uh, of omega, this would be omega prime maybe, would be uh, basically uh, some, some uh, 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 quantity eta, some normalization times the delta function of omega minus omega hat. I should, uh, sorry, the, the, the proper way to write this down is uh, to say this is a function of omega, not omega hat, but the index alpha becomes uh, omega hat prime, okay? So uh, the, the basis function in the pixel basis, each basis function is a delta function in the direction of omega prime. So the, the uh, uh, index alpha that's, uh, uh, enumerating the uh, basis functions is actually a pixel on the sky. So for a given direction, uh, omega prime, uh, this function is uh, simply a delta function between omega and omega prime with some normalization. And uh, if, we, uh, if we apply this um, uh, uh, to, to the above equation for, for gamma, then gamma omega hat prime, so instead of alpha, we're putting in omega prime as, a, as an index, uh, this uh, quantity would end up being one half, uh, whoops, the, the integral will be gone because of the, uh, the delta function. So we just have the sum over the polarizations. We have the uh, um, two pi i f omega hat dot uh, delta x over c. Uh, and then we have the f1 and f2. If uh, we have the uh, uh, spherical harmonic basis, uh, then in that case, um, so, Then in that case, uh, e uh, uh, becomes uh, uh, the, index, the index alpha becomes becomes two indices l and m, uh, a function of omega will just be y l m of omega. Okay, so our basis function is now it's very har spherical harmonics, and the index alpha uh, for the uh, for the, for these gamma functions will be uh, actually a, a two element index l and m. And the gamma LM of F and T will be, uh, uh, we'll have one half, the sum over A, we'll have the integral over D omega. And then uh, now we'll have Y LM of omega uh, multiplying everything else, the base, uh, the, the phase factor uh, two pi I F omega dotted into delta X and then F1 and F2. So uh, all of these objects uh, can be calculated, right? Uh, these are uh, uh, for for a given uh, uh, for a given detector pair. 
uh, we, we know what the delta x is, and we can then evaluate these integrals at least numerically once uh, before we do any analysis of, of actual LIGO and Virgo data. Uh, and, uh, 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 and therefore, we know what these, uh, what these factors are, even though they might be uh, complicated. The upshot of it, though, is that the uh, expectation value of C, our cross correlator, is H of F times uh, P sub alpha, whatever alpha uh, basis we choose, uh, times gamma sub alpha of F and T. Okay, so that's very important because uh, what this ends up being is uh, uh, a, a simple dot product of a vector P and a vector gamma. Okay, now. In order to complete the analysis, we need to know the covariance matrix uh, uh, corresponding to these P sub alphas. And uh, uh, whoops, uh, to do that, uh, we, can, uh, we can calculate uh, the uh, uh, covariance matrix between um, elements FT and F prime T prime. And that uh, is the expectation value of CFT uh, times CF, CF prime T prime. One of these should be starred and then minus uh, uh, the expectation value of CFT star uh, times the CF prime T prime, okay? And uh, you, we can go through the same calculation, similar calculation to, to what we did uh, with uh, the isotropic case. Uh, I won't go through it uh, as there is nothing particularly illuminating there, uh, uh, but the results will be, uh, there will be a delta function in T and T prime, delta function in F and F prime, which is basically the uh, assumption that the noise between neighboring uh, frequency bins or the, uh, the noise between uh, two time segments will be, will, will be uh, uncorrelated. And then we have uh, P1, this is the PSD of the detector one, uh, and P2, which is the PSD of a detector two. And uh, I keep the uh, index T here, just to keep in mind that uh, uh, we have to calculate the PSD for every single uh, time segment that we, would, that we use, a 60 second time segment, for example. Um, now, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to estimate our goal, it, of course, is to estimate these P alphas. That's uh, if we know uh, what the P alphas are, uh, then, uh, 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 then going back here, we can calculate uh, the full sky map, right? Uh, uh, P alpha, E alpha would give me the full uh, map on the sky. So uh, the, the objective then is to find what the P alphas are. And um, uh, here we take a little bit different approach, which actually turns out to be equivalent. Uh, rather than trying to come up with the optimal filter like we did in the isotropic case, we're going to write down uh, a likelihood function uh, and ma will maximize the likelihood function to find the P sub alphas. And it turns out that you can do the same thing in the isotropic case. You can, uh, <clears throat> instead of writing the optimal filter and, and optimizing the SNR to find what that filter should be, you could write down the optimal, the uh, likelihood uh, in that case as well, in the isotropic case, and, um, uh, and uh, maximize it uh, to find the same uh, estimator Y that we found uh, uh, earlier. Uh, and you, there are there are papers out there, um, especially the review paper by uh, Alan, by um, uh, Joe Romano and uh, um, Neil Cornish. They they wrote the review paper maybe a couple of years ago uh, uh, that uh, goes through these different uh, calculations, and you can you can see um, uh, that argument there as well. So uh, L, the likelihood uh, will be uh, basically a Gaussian, uh, but it will be a multivariate Gaussian. Uh, so here we will have, um, let me write it like so. So uh, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the first part has to be uh, data minus the model. So this will be our data, C star F T minus our model will be basically the expectation value of C F T star. Oops. So that's, uh, that's uh, uh, we have to square this. So I'll have, uh, now these are vectors, right? You can think of, uh, uh, CFT as, as a vector here because it has the, the uh, indices F and T. So to square it, we have to multiply it uh, with another copy of it, um, but um, transposed. So we'll have CF prime T prime minus the expectation value of CF prime T prime. 
and uh, keep in mind that uh, uh, these should be should be transposed uh, if if you were to write them as vectors. And then in between, there has to be a covariance matrix uh, inverse, right? So th this is where NFT F prime T prime comes in, and then close the bracket. So this is our likelihood. We're basically trying to maximize uh, uh, this uh, multivariate Gaussian, uh, and um, to be explicit. Uh, I can uh, uh, I can rewrite uh, the expectation value in terms of uh, what we have calculated above. The, the expectation value, oops, uh, is right here. It's the boxed equation, right? Uh, so so that will be minus h of f p sub alpha gamma sub alpha. Oops. Of f and t. Okay, and uh, we have to put in some stars here. So this will be, uh, uh, this is a complex object in general and, and so is gamma. Okay, and then we have the uh, uh, inverse NFT, but we will be assuming uh, uh, basically that uh, the, there is no correlation between different frequencies and different times. So this then can be written as simply P1 of F and T, uh, P2 of F and T, okay. Uh, and that's basically I'm reading off the result uh, that I'm just underlining now. Okay. Uh, and then uh, what we have uh, left over is CF prime T prime minus uh, the expectation value again is H of F uh, P sub, uh, 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 this will be some, some different index uh, uh, doing the summation. So P sub beta uh, and then uh, gamma some be sub uh, beta of, uh, uh, of F and T. Uh, and sorry, I should have uh, changed. There are no primes anymore. Uh, am I missing something? There should be a negative in the exponential, right? For it to be Gaussian. Uh, yes, absolutely. There should be. Uh, just one second. Thank you for catching that. Um, let me see. I just want to make sure I cover all of that. Yeah, there should be a minus sign uh, in both cases. Absolutely. And I have that area in my notes as well. I'll, I'll have that fixed. Okay, so I think this is the likelihood that we want to maximize. Uh, and we're now in the realm of uh, um, uh, linear algebra uh, because basically what we have here is, uh, is, is a vector. So you can think of this as a C vector minus uh, a C uh, expected vector times a matrix, which is uh, an inverse times uh, again, C uh, minus C expected, uh, where, where one of these should be transposed, right? So we, we have, uh, <clears throat> this is a, a vector situation which we can solve with li linear algebra. And uh, uh, I will just give you the, the solutions. Uh, the P sub alpha end up, uh, can be written as a, a product of a matrix, uh, a gamma inverse, uh, we'll put in the indices alpha and beta here, times uh, um, uh, a vector xb or x beta. And what are these quantities? Well, x beta looks like this. It's a sum over time and frequency of uh, gamma star uh, beta, uh, or this is a function of f and t. Then we have h of f divided by p1 and p2. And then multiplying CFT, this is where the actual data comes in. So we, we calculate the cross correlation and then multiply it with this prefactor, which is a function of F and time, frequency and time, and then sum over all times and all frequencies. And gamma is a matrix. So it has two indices, alpha and beta. Uh, it's also a sum over time and uh, frequency. Uh, and it looks uh, rather similar. Uh, uh, the first part of it looks very similar to above. Okay, but then instead of CFT, we have another factor of gamma. So uh, some nomenclature, uh, this quantity here uh, is called the Fisher matrix or Fisher information matrix. 
it basically captures uh, the covariance between uh, different um, uh, components, uh, the different modes, alpha and beta. If we're working in pixel bases, this will be the, the covariance between different pixels. If we're dealing in the LM bases, this will be the covariance between different spherical harmonic modes. Uh, this quantity here is what we refer to as dirty map. It's a very uh, uh, colloquial or jargon that we're using really. Uh, but the idea here is that um, uh, uh, if I start with my cross correlation, which I can easily calculate, right? That's, uh, um, I take my data from LIGO and Virgo detectors, uh, Fourier transform it, uh, and uh, multiply the two Fourier transforms to get uh, this cross correlation. Then I multiply it by H of F, uh, uh, normalized by the, the power spectral densities, and, mu and multiply by this uh, gamma factor, which uh, encodes also the, uh, uh, the basis uh, on the sphere that I'm using. This results in numbers X beta, which uh, en uh, 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 encode uh, the, the map of the gravitational wave sky convolved with a detector response. So if you want to then deconvolve that uh, uh, detector response, you have to take the inverse of this Fisher matrix and act with it on uh, the dirty map. And this is what we then refer to as the clean map. So the, uh, the estimators uh, P sub alpha basically tell us uh, 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 what the gravitational wave sky should be. They're estimators of the gravitational wave sky uh, energy density in different directions after removing the effect of the, uh, 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 of the detector antenna pattern and so on. So that's, uh, um, uh, th this looks a little bit messy, but in principle, this is the recipe on, uh, for how you can do this calculation. Again, these gammas, you can calculate them. These are geometric factors, so you calculate them once. And once you do that, uh, this calculation then becomes trivial, right? You have the gamma factors, you multiply by H of F, which is the assumption you make. So it's some sort of a power law. Uh, the, these are power spectral densities, which you can also measure from the data. Um, and, uh, uh, and similarly for, for X uh, sub beta, you can, you can again do the same, uh, this, Three factor is easy to calculate and you multiply with the cross correlation, you get a dirty map. So that's, that's, uh, uh, that's how this works. Uh, a couple of words uh, also, uh, a couple of notes to make the uh, variance of the uh, dirty map. So if I were to calculate X beta, uh, sorry, X alpha times X beta star, uh, minus X alpha expected value, X beta star expected value. This will be the covariance matrix for the uh, estimators X beta. So for the dirty map, you will find that this is very, uh, uh, very well approximated by the, uh, the Fisher matrix itself. So the Fisher matrix is the covariance matrix for the dirty map. You can think of it that way. You can also uh, show that if I take the clean map uh, uh, estimators, P alpha and P beta star, and you calculate the covariance matrix for them, okay, uh, this turns out to be very well approximated by gamma inverse sub alpha beta. So the inverse Fisher matrix is uh, uh, basically the covariance matrix for the clean map. So you have everything here. All right, uh, if you calculate the, the, the Fisher matrix and the dirty map, and then you uh, invert the Fisher matrix and uh, apply it to the dirty map, you get the clean map. You have uh, both the estimators and you have the covariance matrix for those estimators, whether they're in the dirty map or, or the clean map, uh, both of them are, are available. And uh, you can use either one of them to study different models, for example, and so on afterwards. Uh, they're, they're perfectly, um, interchangeable. Furthermore, uh, it doesn't matter what basis you use. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, so it doesn't matter what basis you choose. Uh, uh, this is uh, really just choosing a basis is a matter of uh, convenience uh, and, and your, your own preference when you do the analysis. You can choose the, the uh, pixel basis and go through the entire analysis, or you can choose spherical harmonic basis and go through the an entire analysis in the end, you will get um, the estimators P sub alpha and X uh, uh, sub, sub beta or whatever in the basis you chose. 
And when you multiply that with your basis elements, pixels or, or uh, spherical harmonics, uh, you will get the, the uh, uh, recovery of, the, of this uh, gravitational wave uh, background map. So uh, uh, in the end, uh, when, you, when you actually uh, compute P sub alpha, uh, E sub alpha, whatever your basis is, and you sum over all alpha, this will be your P of omega. This will be the actual uh, uh, distribution of the, uh, of the rotation wave on the sky. So again, whatever basis you, you choose, whether it's the pixels or, or the uh, spherical harmonics or, or something else, this procedure will work. You will come up with P sub alpha for the basis you chose. And then when you compute this sum, you will get uh, your map. And in fact, there are uh, uh, codes there, for example, to uh, convert from, let's say, spherical harmonic to, to pixel basis and, and, and uh, vice versa. So you, uh, the, the choice of basis is a matter of convenience. Having said that, uh, if you're working, if you're uh, trying to detect pixels, so point sources on the sky, you might choose the pixel basis as the more natural uh, choice for that kind of analysis. If you're trying to uh, detect more extended objects on the sky, so for example, you might be going after gravitational wave of foreground that's generated by uh, objects in our galaxy, then uh, you would expect the background to be anisotropic with uh, kind of the galactic plane across the sky being lit up, uh, being, being, having the stronger background. So in that case, uh, it might be more appropriate to choose the spherical harmonics because uh, they're, uh, they're more appropriate for uh, uh, for, for studying extended objects on the, on the sky. Um, there's one other uh, 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 twist, if you like. Um, if, you're, if you're working in the spherical harmonic case, uh, then you can also define these quantities C sub L, which are defined as, um, uh, sorry, I don't know why I'm making so many mistakes today. So we have one over two L plus one times a sum for all uh, Ms from minus L to L of uh, P sub L M. These are the estimators P sub L M uh, squared. So if you take all of your estimators, uh, square them and sum over all Ms for a given L, you will get uh, what, is re what we usually refer to as C sub L. The this is the angular power spectrum. And the advantage of this is uh, L's effectively encode the angular uh, scale. So uh, big L corresponds to small angles on the sky. And, um, and it's a way of, uh, 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 of describing how much uh, power is uh, stored on different angular scales uh, on the sky. So you have probably seen uh, plots of CL versus L uh, for, for example, for the uh, cosmic microwave background. Uh, uh, there, uh, these are very famous, right? Uh, where, for example, from Planck, uh, where they actually get their picture of the CMB sky, and then they evaluate uh, these uh, C sub L, give, giving us, um, I'm just gonna catch it, sketch it really quickly with a, a, a first uh, uh, acoustic peak, and then a few other peaks going, getting smaller and smaller. So this is, uh, uh, for the CMB case, this is what uh, uh, what the curves look like, and then you can fit a cosmological models uh, to this curve and um, and study the contribution of matter and their dark energy and so on. Uh, so uh, this is uh, uh, this is what we're aiming to to do in the gravitational wave uh, case as well. Except uh, so far we have not detected the background yet. Uh, so uh, uh, this is probably. Uh, going to be more rele relevant as we go as we move forward. The other thing that I wanted to say is that this Fisher matrix that's the, defined here is uh, not always uh, uh, invertible, and the issue is that um, for any given um, uh, detector pair, like uh, Hanford Livingston uh, uh, pair uh, of detectors, there are directions on the sky to which this particular uh, 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 detector pair is uh, not very sensitive. Uh, so uh, that means 
that uh, there are uh, uh, zero eigenvalues uh, inside of this um, um, Fisher matrix gamma. So if I try to invert it, uh, um, I, will, uh, I will fail because the, the matrix is singular. So you have to regularize it to calculate the inverse, which you, you need in order uh, to calculate the clean map. Uh, the inverse shows up here. And, uh, uh, and, and there are different ways of regularizing uh, such matrices. Uh, one approach is to identify the, the small eigenvalues, replace them by uh, infinity, uh, and then uh, uh, convert back from the eigen basis into the, uh, um, into the spherical harmonic basis or whatever you're using. Um, that uh, inadvertently changes the Fisher matrix. So it introduces a bias in the estimate of uh, P sub PLMs and CLs. But this, estimate, uh, this bias can be estimated and subtracted away. So uh, uh, this is uh, uh, the approach that's, uh, that's taken in uh, uh, gravitational wave um, uh, searches by, by LIGO and Virgo. So now I wanted to um, show you some slides uh, uh, of um, uh, where we stand in terms of the, the, um, the searches. Um, well, can I ask a, a quick question? Absolutely, please go ahead. What is the ref angular resolution of this um, anisotropic surge? Is it typically the diffraction limit? I will, I will try to discuss that uh, in a little bit more detail uh, in a few minutes. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that's an excellent question though. Um, so, uh, uh, so, so basically um, uh, uh, this is, uh, we already wrote, uh, wrote this down uh, where uh, this P of F and omega is the, uh, um, what shows up in the two point correlation function. We can assume it to, to ha have this kind of a form uh, in the case of uh, 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 searches for point sources. Uh, we refer to this as the radiometer search, or um, uh, we could do a spherical harmonic decomposition, as we said, uh, which is uh, more suitable for, for searching for extended objects on the sky. Um, and uh, um, these are the examples. So this would be uh, an example of a point source on the sky. This would be an example of something that might be extended, like a, 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 a set of pulsars or magnetars in, in the galactic plane. Uh, so, so you would you would see the part of the sky uh, light up that's along the uh, the, the Milky Way. Now, this one uh, is uh, this is a simulation done by one of my uh, 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 Indian collaborators in the LSC, uh, Anirban Ain. Uh, he worked on directional uh, searches. And um, I wanted to, to, he did a couple of very interesting simulations that really illustrate and help visualize uh, how these searches work. So uh, what you will see here is uh, for at any given moment in time. So if I take any, let's say a 60 second long segment, uh, this is where my point source would be on the sky. At uh, any given time, there will be a circle of points on the sky that, will, course, that could explain the data I observe with a particular uh, time shift or phase shift between two detectors uh, that I'm using. Uh, so at any given time, there will be a circle, but that circle will move around the sky. So let me play this uh, simulation. You see how that circle moves around. This is uh, the, uh, that circle basically summed over uh, uh, all times. And you see how initially uh, it started off there, but uh, uh, as it moves around, it's effectively pivoting around uh, this point here, which is the actual uh, point where the where the uh, uh, where the source is. So what you're observing here, this is what we would refer to as the dirty map. Uh, for each time segment, you get a circle. That circle moves around and effectively pivots uh, around this particular point, and in the end, you get something that looks like a figure eight centered at the uh, at the point where the um, uh, where the, the, the actual signal, the actual point source uh, uh, sits. So this would be, uh, the, the end result here would be the, uh, um, what we refer to as the dirty map, which is the signal itself that we have convolved with uh, a, a response of, uh, of our detectors, our antenna pattern for the, the detector pair we chose. So the clean map, uh, this, this antenna pattern is effectively encoded in the Fisher matrix. And uh, uh, by uh, applying the inverse of the Fisher matrix to this map, 
uh, then gives us a clean map that uh, looks uh, basically more like this. So it removes this figure eight uh, from, from, the, from the picture. Uh, uh, Anirban did also this uh, a simulation where now instead of a point source, we have an extended object and he just used SGWB, a stochastic gravitational wave background. And you can track what happens. Uh, initially, there is nothing that you can see, but with time, you start to see uh, 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 this pattern emerge as, uh, as, as the Earth makes a full circle. So I, I, I find these uh, uh, simulations really, really nice um, because they, they clarify how, um, how the rotation of the Earth allows these circles to move around the sky and uh, in a way that eventually uh, allows this pattern to emerge. Okay, um, so the, uh, the other thing I wanted to mention here is the regularization. Uh, so um, uh, I mentioned that the Fisher matrix might be a singular. And this is the, uh, I wanted just to give you an illustration of how bad the situation is. Uh, uh, what, what you see here is the eigenvalues on the y-axis of the Fisher matrix as a function of uh, their index for uh, two uh, combinations or, or detectors. The, the dashed curves are uh, HL, so Hanford Livingston, and uh, the, the um, solid ones are for HLV, so adding three detectors, right? So uh, having Hanford, whoops, sorry about that, Hanford Livingston and Virgo. The three colors correspond to three different values of alpha. Uh, so alpha here is the uh, power index uh, uh, for, for the uh, uh, frequency dependence of the stochastic background. And remember uh, alpha of zero would be preferring uh, or, or is kind of designed for flat energy density uh, like uh, uh, backgrounds that like the ones from uh, cosmology, from inflation and so on. Two thirds would correspond to the compact binary coalescences Three may correspond to some other astrophysical type backgrounds like um, uh, core collapse and so on. So uh, when you when you uh, look at this, uh, what you see is uh, uh, well several things. Uh, you see that at, uh, 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 the eigenvalues here are arranged in um, uh, descending order, starting from the largest to the smallest. So you see that there is a large fraction of the eigenvalues that are actually okay. But then it, uh, 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 there's a knee effectively and the value of the eigenvalues starts to drop relatively sharply. Uh, the uh, um, uh, situation improves a little bit uh, when you go from two to three detectors because adding the third detector allows you to break the generacy. So, uh, or uh, if there is a particular direction in which let's say Hanford Livingston is not sensitive, Hanford Virgo or, 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 or Livingston Virgo could step in and try to measure those directions. And that effectively helps remove uh, some, of the, uh, 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 some of these blind directions. Uh, in this particular analysis, this was, I believe, uh, using O3, Virgo was not quite as sensitive as the uh, uh, LIGO detectors. So it, uh, it didn't help uh, in, term, in this way very much, but you can see that it does help. And uh, when the um, uh, sensitivities uh, uh, improve and they're about equal, uh, we actually find that adding the third detector effectively removes this drop. So uh, uh, the, the, the Fisher matrix effectively self-regularizes. The other thing that you see is that um, <clears throat> for different alphas, we have different curves. And that is because uh, if you use a, a larger alpha, uh, so, so the, the, the frequency increases faster. Uh, that means that you can use higher frequencies uh, to, to do your search. Higher frequencies correspond to smaller, angular, smaller wavelengths and therefore smaller angular scales on the sky. Uh, so you can, uh, you can go to a larger value of L uh, in, your, in your expansion. So this goes back to the question of angular resolution. Uh, uh, effectively for larger alpha, you can go to higher values of L and, uh, and therefore you have more eigenvalues, uh, larger, larger matrices, larger Fisher matrices to, to, uh, to look through. Okay, uh, we'll skip that one. These are the results uh, from, uh, from the recent uh, um, uh, um, 
from the 03, 01, 02, and 03 analysis. Uh, so this, this paper just came out uh, a couple months ago. <clears throat> and what you see here is the SNR map. So, so the maps of the, uh, 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 this cross correlation estimator uh, divided by the sigma in, in uh, each uh, pixel on the sky. <clears throat> and what you see uh, is uh, the SNR is for uh, three different values of alpha again. Uh, this color scale is shown here and you see that it basically goes between, let's say, minus three and three. Uh, so uh, anywhere on the sky, uh, the SNR is basically uh, most of the time between plus and minus two. There are occasional uh, outliers. Uh, you can calculate um, the significance of this uh, and uh, it's, not, it's not very high. Um, so the significance of these higher, higher, highest SNRs is in tens of percent, so uh, not not uh, not very significant. So we uh, the, uh, do not claim any detection here, uh, and instead place upper limits. So now you can you can calculate the upper limit in each direction on the sky, and this is what those maps look like. And uh, you also see that the, the granularity, the resolution, is different in these three maps, and that again goes back to the fact that for alpha of three. You can use higher frequencies corresponding to uh, uh, smaller angular scales on the sky, so that's why uh, these maps look more detailed uh, than than uh, the other two. The results that we get uh, are these upper limits. They're about a factor of two or three better than what was done with the previous analyses, and that's kind of the, the main message of the paper. Uh, those are all summarized uh, in in uh, this table again for different values of alpha. Uh, these are the three different pairs, Hanford uh, Livingston, Hanford Virgo, and Livingston Virgo. And uh, the p-value is in percents in the brackets here. You see that uh, uh, these are the maximum uh, SNR pixels and they're all, uh, you know, tens of percent uh, in terms of significance. And then this is finally the upper limit uh, range across the map. So the smallest and the, the largest upper limits. Uh, and um, if you compare to the previous paper, 01 to 02, it's about a factor of two to three improvement. Uh, what I've shown you here, uh, these maps are what we call uh, a radiometer search. So this is done in the pixel basis. Uh, the next uh, set of, uh, of maps is uh, in the spherical harmonic basis. So we repeat the analysis in both bases and uh, effectively compare uh, the results and uh, similar results uh, or similar conclusions are, are obtained. Uh, we can calculate again the upper limit uh, 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 values uh, and again they're a factor two to three better than before. For the spherical harmonic case, as I mentioned, you can also compute C sub L's. These are the, uh, uh, um, uh, this is the angular power spectrum and, uh, and you, you see the upper limits on CLs uh, shown with these three different colors. Um, uh, for the three different values of, of alpha. Uh, similar to before, it's a factor of two or three uh, improvement relative to, to O1 and O2. And again, you see that for, for uh, alpha of three, we go to significantly higher values of L um, than, uh, than for the other two smaller values of alpha. So one question, um, yeah. let me go back. So this is, sorry, this was the um, upper limit on the CL, is it? Yes, correct. And 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 is there any? I mean, is the is the sort of uh, peak at C L equal to fifteen some statistical fluctuation, or is it something more fundamental? Uh, you're you're asking about this one here. Yeah, that just um, looks out of the book. Yeah. Yeah, I I, I don't. There is nothing significant uh, as far as I know. This is probably just a statistical fluctuation. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, uh, so um, uh, the last uh, result that I can show is uh, we also repeat the analysis in some specific, the most promising directions on the sky where we actually look at the frequency content. So we don't in integrate over frequency, we actually uh, preserve the frequency information. The three uh, interesting directions, so now we're looking for point sources on the sky. So we're using the, the pixel basis, uh, which is what we refer to as the radiometer search. And uh, the three interesting directions are the uh, SCO X1, uh, uh, which is uh, a very bright uh, source of X-rays on the sky. 
uh, the 1987 supernova direction and the galactic center. So th those are the three directions we, we thought might be the most promising in terms of maybe uh, uh, giving us some sort of a, a, a narrow band signal so at a particular frequency or, um, uh, or frequency band. And, um, and uh, there you see the results are shown in the, in the gray, uh, the, upper, uh, the upper limit is shown in the, the gray. Uh, and the one sigma sensitivity is shown as the, this black line uh, for each of these three directions. And, and um, uh, in each of these three directions, we find frequency bins that have uh, the highest SNR and their significance is uh, typically uh, not very high in, in, in any of these uh, searches. So we, we place upper limits um, in this case as well. Uh, I should point out that uh, uh, this, these are searches for narrow band signals. So this is not uh, your typical stochastic search. We do it uh, because we can. Uh, and because also if we were to uh, see anything interesting, uh, this could the these, uh, uh, if we, let's say find a particular frequency bin uh, towards score X1 that uh, has a particular large uh, signal, we could uh, um, uh, follow up that, uh, that kind of a signal with uh, dedicated searches that look for narrow band uh, continuous wave signals. So this would be uh, uh, non-stochastic signals, but uh, signals that are uh, more deterministic that follow the Doppler shifting due to the motion of the earth and so on, uh, and properly account for things like that, which we don't in the search. This is just simply looking for the cross correlation. So you can think of it as uh, maybe a, a, a casting your net wide, uh, hoping to see uh, a, a glimpse of something uh, that you can then maybe follow up with a better uh, 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 a search pipeline to to pinpoint in more in more detail. So the uh, uh, maybe I'll stop here uh, for briefly just to see if there are any questions about this so far. <clears throat> Book, uh, uh, if if you assume this most optimistic scenario of the binary mergers and have some really, you know, a, a plus type configuration, et cetera. Um, are we in a position to, to, to determine the sky variability of the astrophysical stochastic background? Yeah, that's, that's a very good question. Um, I, I think uh, the most likely answer uh, to that is that uh, with A plus, uh, we will probably not have enough sensitivity to, to see uh, the, uh, uh, the non-monopole uh, parts of this background. Um, the, the, uh, there, there are multiple groups uh, trying to calculate what the anisotropy should be in the CBC background. And uh, they are predicting the uh, higher monopoles to be maybe a factor of 100 or so uh, weaker. Uh, so that would, that would make them uh, probably not accessible to, to uh, uh, these kinds of directional searches. However, uh, uh, you may know this, uh, there, is, uh, there is another uh, approach uh, to looking for the stochastic background uh, due to black hole binaries specifically. And this is, uh, this, it goes by the name of the Bayesian search or T TBS. Uh, and the idea there is that uh, you do the, the uh, CBC type parameter estimation that we now do for, uh, uh, for uh, uh, triggered um, times, right? When we, when we think we have a signal we do the parameter estimation. Well, it turns out that you can, you can do parameter estimation for all times. And uh, uh, for each, let's say, uh, four second segment, you do a, a parameter estimation looking for the binary black holes. That gives you a, a distribution uh, of uh, binary parameters in that segment. And then you can combine, even if there isn't, uh, if, even if there isn't one, you can combine all of these um, Posteriors uh, in uh, in a uh, statistically rigorous way, so as to get the the, uh, uh, the distributions of masses, chirp masses, or uh, uh, distances, and so on uh, across the population, as well as the duty cycle, so the, the rate. Um, and uh, this turns out to be uh, significantly more sensitive uh, than than the cross correlation search that I've been describing here. Um, but specifically targeting the binary black holes. 
And uh, uh, there are also studies uh, that were done by um, multiple people, including our group here, uh, to, to extract, for example, the angular, uh, angular distribution on the sky uh, from these kinds of uh, po population posteriors. Uh, and uh, uh, we, we are not out of the woods there yet. Uh, uh, there, is, there are uh, challenges uh, in the form of not really understanding the statistics and the importance of the priors and various uh, correlations and so on that uh, may induce biases. Um, so uh, uh, there's, uh, this is an active area of, uh, of research, uh, but if we could get it to work, uh, it is conceivable that uh, uh, that approach would be a factor of thousand-ish uh, better than, than the cross-correlation. And uh, that may open up a, a window into, uh, into uh, the angular, angular distribution of the uh, uh, CBCs. So okay, thank you. maybe a bit longer answer, but uh, the, 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 does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah thank you. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so I wanted to come back uh, to, uh, I think it was your question, Ajit, uh, uh, on the, what is the angular resolution? Uh, so what we have done in the past, uh, in, in all of our papers so far uh, in the LIGO Virgo, uh, is we assumed what we refer to as a diffraction limit. And the diffraction limit, uh, if you, uh, this is really uh, an optics uh, concept. Uh, the diffraction limit uh, basically refers to the size of the receiver that you have. So for example, if you're dealing with a telescope, that telescope will have some opening uh, uh, described by, by this uh, D, so that would be the diameter of it. And uh, uh, if your, and your diffraction limit would be basically given by this combination. So the speed of light divided by two, by, by two lambda where lambda could, uh, 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 sorry, but lambda divided by 2d, where lambda is c over f, uh, and f here is the frequency. So if, uh, if we adopt the same, uh, uh, the same approach, and then uh, the maximum L that you, you, you look for is given basically by pi divided by your diffraction limit. So if we adopt this approach uh, for uh, LIGO searches, the distance here is about a thousand uh, kilometers. The frequency, uh, the sensitive frequency for our searches is typically of order 50 hertz. The angular resolution then ends up uh, uh, being of order uh, uh, 50 degrees or so, and the L max ends up being three to four. So, uh, um, if you, uh, this is why, for example, when we choose alpha of three or four, sorry, uh, when we choose alpha of uh, zero or two thirds, uh, we end up with L max of three or four. Uh, and, and you have, uh, I've shown it to, to you as well uh, here. So uh, we, we end up for alpha of zero or two thirds, uh, we have very few L's that we look for. However, uh, if we, if for alpha of three, we can go to uh, frequencies of order 150 Hertz and then uh, the L max could be, could be several times larger than this. However, uh, uh, more recently, we've been starting to, to revise this uh, and to, to, to we're been trying to understand a little bit more, what do we mean by angular resolution? And this turns out to be a, a very subtle uh, concept and we're still really wrestling with it. Uh, and I'll try to uh, highlight where the, the uh, difficulties come from. So um, in, in our search, uh, we don't really have a, a, a receiver, uh, strictly speaking. We have, we're have we basically looking at time delay between two receivers uh, to extract the directional information. So that uh, then uh, questions, is this the right uh, uh, diffraction limit to, to use? And uh, um, uh, one uh, way to get some intuition is uh, to think about toy models. So here is one really simple toy model well, imagine that we're, we're dealing with water waves, okay? Uh, and we have two buoys, uh, A and B. So these are just sitting on the surface of the water and they're going up and down as the waves pass through and they can measure their own height, okay? So by measuring uh, uh, their own height, they know when they're at the peak of the wave, when they're at the trough of the wave and so on. Uh, and their timing, uh, let's say, is even infinite, so that they can uh, they have excellent uh, uh, accuracy in, in measuring the waves passing through. Uh, if if I have excellent timing in these uh, 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 in these two buoys, that means I have an excellent uh, measurement of uh, the time delay between uh, A and B 
uh, for when the peak passes through. And that in turn tells me that I have an excellent measurement of the uh, direction in which that wave is propagating if I assume the wave to be a plane wave, right? So if I know uh, uh, if it's a plane wave, and I know uh, the time delay between uh, when the peak hits buoy A versus when it hits the buoy B. From that time delay, I can uh, uh, calculate the uh, direction of, the, of this plane wave. And if, if my accuracy in time domain is, is very good, then I will have very good accuracy in, um, in uh, uh, the angle of the, uh, of the wave as well. And you can do this, this simulation uh, numerically and uh, you can show that there is really no diffraction limit uh, of any kind that comes in here, right? So uh, uh, if, if, I, if I have just a single wave and I look at the, the time delay between um, uh, two measurements uh, in space of this wave, I can get uh, uh, arbitrarily accurate uh, measurement of the direction of the wave uh, uh, independent of any, any diffraction limit. So there, there is no uh, diffraction limit to worry about in this kind of a situation. However, if I were to add a second one, so if I had another wave coming in here, then uh, uh, these two buoys will be measuring the uh, uh, superposition of these two waves and the situation becomes uh, very complicated. Um, so uh, uh, in that case, um, the, the approach I'm using of measuring the time delay between these two buoys uh, will simply not work anymore. The, the system will get confused. So then you have to start thinking, okay, let's, let me take a step back. I don't have a single wave anymore. I have two waves. So let me try to uh, 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 devise an algorithm that will measure uh, direction of two waves rather than of a single wave. So now you're changing your, uh, your analysis. You, you have a different assumption. You no longer have a single wave to estimate. You have two waves. You can probably do a good job with that as well. But this then, of course, raises the question, well, what if I don't know how many waves there are? And in the stochastic backgrounds, um, you are assuming that there are waves coming in from all directions. So there are, in principle, infinitely many of them. So this is where uh, the issue really comes from. Uh, and Andrew Mattis has, uh, has done some, uh, some work on, on this front as well. And he has uh, shown that if you take this, uh, 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 this idea or, or this model of the two buoys uh, and, uh, and try to do the, uh, um, uh, to, to implement the, the radiometer formalism, like the same uh, uh, anisotropic formalism that we had that I just discussed today, but apply it to these buoys and, and water waves and so on. Uh, he found that uh, if, the, um, uh, uh, if the buoys are uh, isotropically responsive, so meaning that it uh, doesn't matter which direction the wave is coming from, uh, the buoys uh, can measure the, the, the water wave, the, the height of the water. Then in that case, he found that um, there is a Fisher matrix in that case as well. And that Fisher matrix, matrix ends up being proportional to a Bessel function with this particular argument, which peaks basically at the usual diffraction limit. So uh, he recovers the diffraction limit in this case where there are infinitely many waves and uh, uh, you don't know how many there are, but you're trying to measure the behavior of the population of the waves. He also found that uh, if you have buoys that, uh, are, uh, that have a lighthouse response, and by that he means if the wave comes from this particular direction, I can measure it, but if it comes from a different direction, I can. Then in that case, he actually found that uh, uh, he can beat the diffraction limit as well. So the upshot of all of this is that um, the uh, diffraction limit, so to speak, doesn't uh, uh, apply in the usual sense uh, to, to these um, uh, uh, anisotropic searches for stochastic background. But uh, if you have detectors that are isotropically responsive, which we don't, uh, then uh, you can recover the, uh, um, the, uh, 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 the diffraction limit effectively. The, the same uh, uh, limit shows up. Uh, but as I said, uh, our detectors are not isotropic. They actually have directionality. Uh, they are more sensitive in some directions than others. And that antenna pattern uh, 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 moves around the sky as the Earth moves, uh, rotates around its axis. So we are sitting somewhere in between these two cases. Uh, uh, we are in a, a somewhat lighthouse response uh, mode. So the only way we can 
uh, you know, you can already see the complexity of this. The only way we can we can assess this uh, uh, angular resolution is by by uh, doing a simulation. So we're in the process of doing those now. Um, we have we're doing a mock data challenge, so to speak, to to try to understand uh, what is our angular resolution when we're dealing with a, a single point source on the sky, when we're dealing with two point sources on the sky, and so on, or with something more extended. Uh, and uh, it turns out it also matters uh, whether you are trying to just uh, detect something on the sky. So just uh, ask yourself, do I see anything on the sky? Versus uh, the question of where is the uh, signal coming from on the sky? Uh, the two questions will uh, 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 have different answers. And if you're, turns out that if you are looking for uh, if you're trying to just uh, make a detection, regardless of where on the sky the signal might be coming from, uh, it's okay to use uh, uh, lower values of L. Uh, you have fewer parameters to, to estimate and therefore you have, um, uh, you can get better SNR on them. Um, but if you want to pinpoint where on the sky uh, the signal is uh, coming from, then you uh, have to uh, resort to, to using larger values of L. And that of course has to do Depends on your choice of alpha. Depends on the uh, 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 which uh, detector pairs uh, you're using in the analysis, and so on. So it's it's a fairly complex uh, question, and uh, we're trying to we're trying to wrap our minds around it and, and come up with some sort of a scheme uh, uh, to to use in in our future searches. So uh, Ajit, does that answer your your previous question? Yes. Thanks. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay, so let's see, we have about uh, 20 minutes left. Uh, so let me mention uh, 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 the theory side of this. Uh, so I've, I've discussed a lot uh, how we search for the, for, for the directional backgrounds. Um, over the last uh, four or five years, uh, there's been quite a bit of uh, work in, in the literature on trying to actually measure, uh, oh, sorry, trying to actually predict uh, what the, uh, uh, what uh, uh, this angular uh, dependence or, or the directionality of this background should be. So, uh, and this has been done for different models too. So for the compact binary stochastic background, uh, I would say uh, the two leading groups are uh, uh, groups by Julia Cousin and her collaborators and another one by uh, Maidi Sakalariadu and her collaborators. Um, they, they, they have both studied uh, the uh, black hole binaries and they have both come up with uh, CLs as a function of L. They are disagree at the level of about a factor of 10. Uh, and uh, um, uh, but, but so their predictions are that um, the um, uh, non-monopole or high order multiple moments uh, will be a factor of uh, more than 10 and maybe of order 100. Uh, um, uh, smaller than, uh, than the monopole itself. Uh, they have uh, started to predict uh, the, um, uh, um, the, this is some sort of an astrophysical kernel. Uh, so I, I, uh, you can think of this as uh, being uh, 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 the, the energy density and the angular resolution basically depend on this quantity uh, in, through some rather complex integral. Uh, I've actually included that integral in the notes. Uh, I don't want to go there now because we're kind of running out of time. But uh, if you if you uh, are interested, uh, you know you can take a look at their papers. Uh, the point I wanted to make here is that uh, there may, uh, th this kernel here is a function of both redshift and frequency. Uh, and uh, redshift you can uh, uh, think of as uh, defining the angular scale. Uh, things that are further away, they are smaller on the sky. Uh, so high redshift uh, would correspond to a smaller angular scale. And what you see is that this dependence is non-trivial. Uh, there, the, there is some uh, coupling between uh, frequency and redshift, which would mean between frequency and the angular scale. So when we, when we, uh, when we took that uh, function P of omega and F, we assume that it's separable. Well, they're saying uh, that maybe not, uh, uh, and uh, or we could, if we do, do apply the separation of variables, uh, we uh, we are making an approximation, and we may have to think a little bit uh, about the implications of that. 
these are their predictions for the CLs. Uh, so these are coming from uh, the Cousin papers. Uh, there are similar plots from, from uh, um, uh, Secular Yadio papers. Uh, there are actually other groups now uh, as well looking at, the, at, at this question. And uh, uh, what you see here is um, uh, their predictions now for CL versus L also as a function of uh, uh, frequency. So the, uh, uh, the solid lines here are the 32 Hertz uh, in gravitation wave frequency and uh, the dashed ones are for 100 Hertz. And similarly, uh, 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 the contributions to CL, over, uh, CL versus L from different redshift ranges. Uh, so you can see uh, uh, which of these contributes the most and so on for different Ls. Uh, so that's that's uh, arising, and this is still uh, an active area of research. There is um, uh, there is a, a complication, if you like, uh, on on top of these predictions as well, uh, in the sense that um, we have to think about things like cosmic variance, and we have to think about uh, the uh, uh, the shot noise, in the sense that uh, uh, what what they're what they're predicting here is what the universe would do on average. But uh, we have a specific realization of the universe, which means we have a specific realization of the galaxies and a specific realization of uh, binary black holes uh, in those galaxies. Uh, so, uh, and the specific, uh, some, some of those uh, binaries will, uh, will uh, um, uh, merge uh, while we're observing. So uh, exactly where these uh, uh, binaries are, uh, there is some shot noise associated with it, and uh, that will potentially bias the um, estimates of the CLs. And those, um, uh, you can of course beat this down by observing longer and observing more of these uh, binaries and so on, but the time scales are relatively long to, to beat this down to below uh, systematic or uncertainties or statistical uncertainties from our detectors. So it turns out this shot noise will probably be dominant uh, uh, when we when we do uh, when we uh, uh, start uh, uh, detecting the background and probably what we will observe at first is the shot noise itself rather than uh, than these patterns, um, but that shot noise also ends up uh, having some astrophysical information. So uh, it, it will be an interesting measurement regardless of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, whether it's shot noise dominated or not. Uh, so we're we're in the process of figuring out how to uh, connect our directional searches to uh, to these um, models and and see if we can if we can constrain them in any way. Uh, this is a, a, a similar study that was done by uh, <clears throat> by Iris group, but now focusing on cosmic strings. Um, so uh, you may have heard about cosmic strings uh, last week uh, in the cosmology part of this uh, lecture series. Um, these are basically topological defects from the early universe. Um, uh, when the universe goes through phase transitions, um, uh, when the bubbles in those uh, phase transitions collide, you get topological defects, and um, some of those may be surviving until today. Uh, there are also uh, string theory models that predict the uh, existence of strings on cosmological scales. And these strings can uh, 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 move around, they can reconnect when they intersect and so on, create loops. Uh, there could be uh, kinks and cusps on these loops, uh, as uh, schematically shown here. And, uh, uh, and when, when those uh, uh, happen, they will create gravitational waves, uh, which we may be, observe, may be able to observe as bursts uh, if they're coming individually towards us. Or uh, just like for the binary black holes, we could add up contributions across the entire universe and come up with a stochastic background. So uh, Amairi and uh, her student Alex Jenkins, they looked at this problem and tried to estimate uh, the angular, the angular uh, uh, dependence of, uh, of the stochastic background. And these are the results that they came up with uh, uh, for, for different values of the string tension uh, G mu uh, that, uh, uh, that may, be, may still be possible. So uh, their results are uh, basically showing that uh, um, uh, the, uh, the CLs would probably be about a factor of a thousand or ten thousand smaller than the monopole part in this um, in this model. Uh, yet another twist here uh, that's that's interesting is uh, uh, now we have uh, we're starting to make maps of the stochastic gravitational wave background. Uh, we also have maps of uh, various other uh, um, uh, 
tracers of structure on the sky. So for example, you could, there are galaxy catalogs which uh, tell us where the various galaxies are, how far they are and so on. These are done from surveys like the Sloan Digital Sky Survey or WISE and others. Uh, so the, they, uh, you could use the number count of galaxies as an indicator or a tracer of the, uh, 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 where the matter is uh, on the sky. Uh, you could use similar, similarly uh, the uh, CMB maps, the cosmic infrared background maps, uh, the uh, uh, weak lensing maps, and so on. All of those uh, parameters effectively uh, tell us something about the distribution of matter. So you could ask about, uh, uh, if I take the stochastic background map, uh, like this one here, and I cross correlate it with uh, one of these other maps like the Sloan Digital Sky Survey uh, galaxy map, uh, should I see any correlation? And uh, uh, there are papers uh, done by uh, Cousin at, and uh, her group, her collaborators, that actually predict uh, the angular structure in this cross correlation between the gravitational wave map and the galaxy count map or gravitational wave map and weak lensing maps. Uh, so there are predictions for the angular structure for the CLs. So we are now uh, as part of our efforts also here in Minnesota, is, uh, we're trying to figure out how do we do this uh, measurement? Uh, how do we take the, uh, 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 the, the LIGO uh, stochastic background maps and uh, cross-correlate them uh, with uh, these other maps from uh, galaxy surveys or, or weak lensing or CMB and so on. And uh, how do we do this in a way that um, is um, uh, uh, statistically rigorous? Uh, can, we, can we measure the cross-correlation? Can we extract the, the, the angular structure and so on? Uh, so we did one first paper we did on this topic was uh, asking a relatively simple question uh, can I calculate uh, the cross correlation or effectively what we refer to usually as the coherence. So this is basically taking the gravitational wave map, multiplying it with the galaxy count map, uh, uh, averaging this product over the whole sky and then normalizing it with the power in both gravitational wave and the galaxy count maps. Uh, and uh, what we came up with, uh, so the, the result we get uh, for uh, when we look at uh, the sky map, gravitational wave sky map in the 50 to 100 hertz band uh, and the galaxy counts uh, across all redshifts in the Sloan su survey, we get this red point. To assess whether this is significant or not, uh, we, uh, we do a series of simulations uh, that have just noise and that series of simulations uh, gives us this distribution. So we're sitting somewhere here uh, on the distribution with a 95% uh, of the distribution being uh, denoted by this, uh, this line here. So uh, uh, the upshot of this is that we haven't seen anything uh, uh, significant in this particular study. And then we repeat this for different uh, frequency ranges uh, for the stochastic gravitational wave background map. We uh, repeat it for different uh, redshift ranges in the Sloan survey map. And you get the p-values for, for all of these uh, combinations. And you see that they're basically at the percent level or higher. So, so uh, no, no uh, detection. But this is the simplest thing you can do uh, in the sense that uh, um, uh, it, it basically just gives us one number, which is, do I see a correlation or not? Uh, we're now working on extending this to actually not just say, do I see a correlation or not, but what is the angular structure in this correlation? Uh, and as of right now, we're uh, for O2 at least, uh, we're assuming that uh, there will be uh, no correlation. So we'll be uh, uh, getting null results and so on, but we're trying to put the structure in place uh, uh, so that when we do observe the stochastic background, we will be able to use this as a tool to understand where the background is coming from uh, and uh, how it relates to the distribution of matter on the, uh, throughout the universe and so on. And uh, uh, I think one this question is, about that. Uh, yeah. What is the motivation of dividing the galaxy survey into multiple bins? Because I, I don't quite understand that. Yeah, that, that's a very good question. So uh, the, the motivation here is that uh, things that are further away correspond to smaller angular scales. Uh, and, uh, uh, and things that are closer would correspond to larger angular scales. And because of those uh, angular resolution uh, arguments, uh, our our uh, um, 
uh, angular resolution tends to be relatively poor, uh, be, especially when we look at uh, uh, f to the power two thirds kind of a spectrum. So we, we're looking for things that are uh, probably tens of degrees in the sky, which, uh, which means we're looking for relatively large structures uh, and therefore, um, the relatively uh, nearby structures would uh, would be would be probably of more interest. So the, we we do uh, uh, we do the all redshift uh, uh, analysis as well. So you have these uh, these lines here corresponding to including all of the redshifts, but we do it also in bins uh, uh, just to uh, cover all bases, so to speak. That makes sense. Oh, sorry, I had not seen the all V one. Uh, another question was, uh, this SDSS also has, like, so they, they have something called survey, I forgot what they call it, but basically the fact that the SDSS is not sensitive to all directions, right, in the sky. So is, is that thing folded in here? Uh, so you're, you're, you're asking about uh, the fact that the Sloan uh, survey basically covers a part of the sky and not the whole sky. Yeah, and also in the part of the sky that it covers, it does not, you know, yeah. have like the same number of galaxies and all on, in that yes. part as well. Long yes, so, so uh, there, are, uh, uh, there are systematic. So first of all, uh, we, we limit our, uh, uh, when we do this, uh, this uh, averaging, sorry about that, this averaging, uh, we average only over this part of the sky where we have data from the Sloan. So we ignore the rest of the map. Uh, uh, and that allows us to to uh, uh, to account for the coverage. Uh, in terms of uh, within this region, uh, you're absolutely right. There are uh, areas that are uh, pro better than other areas, and uh, there are issues with uh, uh, seeing or dust and so on. We we try to account for those systematic effects, um, uh, and basically we follow uh, what what was done in the past in the in the literature uh, on that front to account for such. Uh, such uh, uh, issues. Okay. Uh, I should also say Sloan has both uh, a photometric and uh, spectroscopic uh, uh, surveys. The photometric ones are where you measure the uh, uh, intensity of light in several uh, 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 filters and so several, several uh, wavelength bands. So you don't uh, really have a very good measurement of the, uh, uh, of the uh, redshift. Uh, of the uh, of these galaxies, so your your Z is not very well measured in in those surveys, um, but you, there are many more galaxies in there, and the other uh, spectrum sp spectroscopic survey has fewer galaxies, but there is a, a good measurement of the redshift for each of those, so it's a trade off, uh, and we try to do both uh, kind of. Uh, at this point, we're just touching in dark, right? Uh, uh, so we just want to be complete as much as we can be. Okay, thank you. Yeah, no, no problem. Um, so I'll, I'll finish with this slide, uh, which is uh, uh, going back to uh, one of uh, Ajit's questions. Uh, so for specifically for the black hole binaries, there is a, a Bayesian formalism that's been proposed by, um, by Eric Train and uh, Rory Smith several years ago, uh, where the uh, uh, parameter estimation of the comp for the binary black holes is done on all data and not just on data where we uh, have a trigger and think we have, uh, we have a, 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 a binary merger. Uh, and uh, this is of course computation more expensive, uh, but if you do it, uh, you can um, you can extract um, uh, the distribution of uh, population parameters like uh, distribution of the sky, uh, luminosity distance, uh, rate, uh, mass uh, chirp mass distribution, and so on. And then you can uh, you can marginalize over the uh, parameters that you don't care for. Uh, so, for example, maybe in our analysis we don't care about the chirp mass distribution, but we do want to know uh, uh, where on the sky uh, the objects are. And, uh, and uh, uh, Sharon Banagiri, who's a graduate student in my group, he just moved to, to Northwestern uh, for a postdoc position. Um, he he uh, uh, used this approach to estimate uh, CLs and the cross correlations between CLs. Uh, again, this was done for relatively low Ls, up to five or so. Uh, but you can see that he, he was successful in recovering uh, the injected the simulated uh, uh, values. So this, this uh, corner plot uh, here shows 
uh, the uh, uh, correlations between different values of um, uh, different, different CLs and also shows the distribution for each CL individually. You, you see that the, the, the dash curve is the actual injected value and the, the recovered histograms uh, uh, tend to agree well with it. So this is another direction. Uh, as I said, this might be um, much more sensitive than, um, than uh, uh, the cross-correlation search that I've been talking about the last week. Uh, but uh, we have not really, uh, uh, this, is, this is all a Gaussian simulation, uh, Gaussian data simulation. So it's all clean and uh, uh, we understand everything that's going on. Uh, when we move to real data, of course, there are other issues and, and we're, we're now working through uh, through those and hopefully over the coming year or two, uh, this search can become a reality too. So uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is where I'll stop. Uh, uh, thank you very much to everybody for, uh, for the past week. Uh, I had fun with this. I hope uh, it was uh, uh, interesting and, and educational for, every, for you as well. Um, and I also wanna say that, uh, um, uh, you, that you should feel free to reach out to me. Um, uh, my, uh, I don't know if my email address has been circulated, but I can put it in the chat window now uh, and, uh, uh, and feel free to, to just uh, write me an email and if you have any questions and uh, I'll, be, I'll be happy to connect with you as well. So I will just put my email address in the chat window in case uh, you'd like to connect. So that's it, I'll, I'll answer any questions uh, uh, at this point, thank you all. Yeah, many thanks. Work. This is a really a wonderful and interesting and very useful uh, set of lectures. Uh, we all learned quite a lot from this. Um, so we do have uh, a few minutes for questions. Ajit, can I go ahead? Yeah, please. Yeah. So, uh, Book, thanks for the lectures. I, I really enjoyed myself. Uh, one thing I have uh, a question about the Bayesian hierarchical search that you said. So uh, I'm just trying to understand it. So is the fact that, let's say you have one year of LIGO Virgo data and you just divide it into, let's say, segments of 16 seconds or so and do a PE using uh, the, the binary black hole waveforms? Is that the idea? Yes, that's exactly it. So, uh, so what we... Please go no, ahead. Please, please, please. So, so what, what we usually do uh, in, in, in our collaboration is uh, we would run... Uh, uh, detection algorithms uh, to find uh, the most promising uh, trigger times. And then uh, we would focus on those times and do the parameter estimation on, on just those. Uh, uh, and those are computationally intensive, uh, which is why they're typically done only when we think we have a, we have a signal. Um, the proposition from uh, 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 Rory Smith and Eric Train was that uh, we should repeat this uh, for all data even when uh, we don't have any triggers. So when we divide the data into uh, 15 second segments, uh, as you suggest, uh, uh, we can, for each of those segments, we can apply the, uh, 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 the parameter estimation uh, procedure and we will get the posterior distributions on chirp masses and, uh, uh, and, and everything else, right? Uh, spins, the location, distance, and so on. And most of the time, uh, those will be uh, uh, not very uh, informative because there will be no signal in that particular uh, 15 second segment. Other times, maybe there is a, a signal, but it's very weak and it's not uh, strong enough for us to claim an individual detection. So, it, uh, 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 so when you put them all together, uh, the idea is that uh, uh, the overall population distribution in chirp masses and so on will, uh, will capture contributions even from the weaker signals that are not individually detectable. Uh, and then this population is, uh, 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 this information about the population is uh, something that we can use uh, to maybe look at the distribution across the sky and, and other things too. Right. So I'm assuming uh, in when you divide these seg uh, into smaller segments of time, I'm assuming one would sort of subtract out all the resolved events from your, is that right? Uh, well, that, that is a choice. Um, okay. uh, you, you could do that, uh, um, but you don't really have to, right? So the choice is, uh, do you want to, do you care about the entire population period? 
uh, or do you want to, do you care about only the unresolvable part uh, where you uh, remove the things that you can resolve? Uh, the, uh, um, both are possible and we've done both over the years. Uh, 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 you know, we've studied both uh, uh, cases. Uh, the, uh, as of right now, it, it doesn't really make much difference because the, the few individually detected uh, objects uh, that, that we have do not impact the overall uh, 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 energy density in the background very much uh, because they're, you know, you, you maybe have uh, uh, a handful or let's say 50 um, uh, uh, detections over a year. So imagine 54 second segments being diluted by the full year of data. Right, yeah, I get that, yeah, thank you. Yeah. So Shashud has an interesting question. Shashud, would you like to ask this yourself? Uh, sure. Uh, so uh, first of all, well, thank you very much for the lectures. They were, they were very illuminating. Uh, so my uh, my question was basically uh, whether we could learn something, say, in the 3G era, when we have very many uh, transient uh, BBH merger detections, uh, whether we could learn something by cross-correlating the catalog of uh, transient PVH mergers with the uh, stochastic gravitational wave background. Uh, the reason I'm, um, I'm asking this is uh, because perhaps we could learn something about large-scale structure at different redshifts. The, the transient mergers would give us information about the large-scale structure at uh, smaller redshifts relatively, and the stochastic background would give us information about the last case structure at larger redshifts. So cross correlation could give us some information. Yeah, uh, you're absolutely right, and uh, uh, we are actually doing that already. Uh, if you if you look at uh, the uh, uh, the latest isotropic search paper that we we published uh, uh, using O3 data, uh, there there are actually plots. Um, uh, where we try to combine the information uh, uh, about the individual detections uh, from, I think that paper is using the only the first half of all three individual detections. Uh, and so uh, inf combines that information with the stochastic background. It's exactly what you're describing. Uh, the individual detections would, uh, would uh, uh, basically probe what's relatively nearby uh, and the stochastic background would probe uh, what's at redshifts one or two. That's where the, the dominant part of the energy density uh, 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 in the stochastic background would come from. And you can then try to use the two to probe the redshift uh, evolution of the, of the binaries. Um, so uh, right now, uh, uh, the, the, uh, when you do that study, uh, the, the dominant part, uh, the dominant information comes from the individual detections simply because we haven't seen the stochastic background yet. So we can only put upper limits uh, uh, on, on, uh, um, uh, uh, on the stochastic background and that turns into upper limits on, uh, 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 on what the uh, uh, redshift evolution of these objects uh, could be. Now uh, for 3G, the situation will be different because there uh, uh, the expectation is that we would be able to individually resolve almost all of the black hole binaries and uh, a large fraction of the uh, neutron star binaries. Uh, so if you individually resolve those and, and if you can subtract them away from the data, then what, what you're left with uh, will not have much stochastic background anymore, uh, at least not the compact binary stochastic background. So at that point, um, we're hoping that uh, uh, that procedure will allow, allow us to look for other types of stochastic background that might be hiding underneath the, um, the CBCs, like the cosmological types and so on. Uh, so so uh, in 3G, it's not clear to me that uh, correlating the individual detections and the stochastic background would be very, very useful at that point, perhaps, uh, but it probably will depend on, on the specific situation. Uh, what might be interesting, though, is in 3G, if you have all of these black hole binary detections, so you have uh, hundreds of thousands or millions of these detections uh, in a year or two, uh, if, you, if you take that catalog and uh, correlate it with the galaxy catalog or something like that, that could be an interesting thing to study as well. So just correlating the, uh, um, the gravitational wave catalogs with catalogs of galaxies or 
uh, weak lensing surveys, things like that. I see. Uh, thank you. That, that answers my question. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay, thank you. Uh, Said Nakvi, you had a hand up. Uh, would you like to ask your question? I know that you have yeah. typed in my chat box. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you, sir, for so like very nice lectures. I just wanted to ask, like, in terms of the the space based detector LISA. So, because this uh, stochastic gravitational wave back background, as I could understand from these lectures, it would be they are coming and hitting the detector all the time. So, will uh, gravitational wave memory play any role, or would it be a sort of a noise kind of thing, or 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 it or it would be so small that it plays sort of no role? Uh so that's that's a good question. Uh, I have not seen yet uh, uh, papers. Uh, uh, I may have missed them, but uh, uh, I have not seen the papers that uh, uh, look at the implication of uh, memory on the uh, uh, on the stochastic background uh, specifically. Uh, I think it would be an interesting thing to study. Uh, there, there may be uh, interesting uh, uh, effects that, that will actually change uh, what, what our model should be. Um, yeah, that's probably all I can say about that. Oh, okay, thank you so much. Yeah. Um, so look, there was a, a question earlier whether uh, these nice simulations that um, Nirban has done um, are these codes or simulations available somewhere? Uh, well, uh, uh, you know, you would have to ask Aniban. Um, I, uh, well, so, so um, the simulations uh, he did and uh, he gave them to me privately. Uh, I don't think they're posted anywhere, but uh, if you reach out to him, he, he might be willing to, to share. The code that he used to do this uh, is, um, uh, mostly available. So, so the search codes that uh, that we use in the LIGO and Virgo collaboration, uh, they are all publicly available through through Git. Um, so you should be able to, if you're interested in in seeing the actual codes and so on, uh, you, you should be able to access them. Uh, and um, if you're having trouble finding them, just let me know, and I can help out. Okay, thank you, Wook. Uh, these are the only questions I've seen in the chat. If people have any questions, this is the last chance. Ah, uh, sorry, I just typed it. So uh, I have one question that uh, would there be imprint of this motion of the Earth and the Doppler effect due to that? Uh, so, uh, so in, in the anisotropy of the uh, SGWB, in in future, would would there be? Uh, like we, we would see more power from uh, from one direction than with respect to other because of that. Yes, I, I, I think the answer to that would be would be yes. Uh, uh, in the same way that uh, in the CMB there is a large dipole moment due to the motion of the Earth relative to the CMB reference frame, uh, we we would expect a similar effect uh, uh, with uh, with with the stochastic background. And uh, do we expect it to be measurable uh, in future? Um, so uh, uh, yes, uh, but as I mentioned before, that, that would probably be a, a, a factor of 10 to 100 uh, weaker than, than the monopole in the best case. So uh, probably won't be detectable uh, uh, over the next uh, three to five years. That would be my expectation using the cross correlation search. Using this uh, uh, Bayesian hierarchical uh, approach, yeah. uh, that, that, that may be more likely. Thanks. thanks. Okay, I don't see any further questions. So let's thank uh, Wook once again for this wonderful um, course that he gave the last five days.